Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to the latest fundraising event for the Blods, the Bexhill Light Opera and Drama Society. Now, I was fortunate enough to contribute to the last fundraising event several months ago now, so for me to once again be able to give something of myself for such a noble and worthy cause is indeed a great honour. No, it is. So much so, in fact, that I now consider myself to be an official blood donor. Uh, yeah, I do. I do. And that's the marvellous thing about being a blood donor, isn't it? It's the very slight, a wonderfully philanthropic possibility that even the smallest theatrical contribution, given with only the very minor inconvenience of feeling just a little bit of a prick, <laughs> might just mean that someone somewhere in the Bexhill area can get a life-affirming transfusion of B-positive blood. <laughs> when they see for themselves that there's a group of people regularly prepared to demonstrate that when it comes to light opera and drama, the prerequisite of any discernible term is dramatically overstated. <laughs> so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I want to urge you all to give blood. Okay? And there's no time like the present, and that's particularly true this evening, because this evening's event is all about giving giving in order to receive. And with that in mind, I need to ask you all a bit of a favour. I want to take advantage of the theatre, of this, of this occasion, and ask you all, I want to ask you all to participate in a little bit of acting with me. Now don't worry, it's not going to be anything too taxing, and for a light opera and drama society, it should literally be just a walk in the cherry orchard, because all I need you to do is to act out giving me a rip-roaring round of applause, followed by a callback to do an encore. Now, I'll explain a little bit more in a second, but essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly contrive a finishing line for a set, say it, thank you all for listening, wish you good night, and then I'm going to start walking off stage over here. And that's when the clapping and the cheering needs to start. But it's got to be good. It's got to be good. It's got to be as if you've just seen something truly exceptional. Yeah? <laughs> then I'm going to go through that door there. And that's when the chanting needs to start. The more, more, more. And, and if the arthritis permits, get out a bit of foot stamping as well, just to give it a bit more oomph. Yeah? And after a few moments of that, I'll come back out on stage to loads of cheering and just finish the set, as I'm contractually obliged to do anyway, but I'll do it as if it was a real encore, just to maintain the illusion. Now, before we do this, I think it's only right that I should share the thinking behind this idea with you. And I should probably start by clarifying, just in case there's any lingering doubt in the room, that I, I don't actually do this stand-up stuff for a living. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Man, man. I don't, I'd like to. Well, I would have liked to, but um, something happened in the park. Well, it was a long time ago. Well, look, 20 odd years ago, on several occasions, I refused to take cocaine. And it's something I deeply regret. I'm profoundly remorseful about it now. I realise how stupid that was. But it has undermined any sort of credibility I might have to do any sort of meaningful stand-up. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't do this, I don't do this for a living. Uh, what I actually do is manufacture and supply crash mats for gymnasiums and sports centres. It's not a particularly glamorous job, uh, but it does give me something I can always fall back on. <laughs> as, well as, as well as providing me with a little bit of much-needed padding to help fill out this set. But the point is, <laughs> the point is, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that I've never actually been asked to do any sort of encore ever before. So for me, this is going to be a completely new experience. But I don't want you guys to feel that because of that, there might be something a little bit underhand or disingenuous about, about doing this. Because although this idea will artificially create a level of audience appreciation far in excess of what this routine actually deserves, that's not the reason we're doing it. No, no, no. The main reason we're doing this is to put us all together 
so we can bump start this routine into becoming a much more rewarding and memorable experience than it was obviously otherwise only ever going to be. <laughs> now rest assured there are some long-standing comedic precedents which support this idea, okay? Um, for example, uh, when somebody just starts laughing out of the blue, absolutely nothing, and then after only a very short period of time, that laughing then becomes intrinsically funny in its own right, thereby generates more laughing, a sort of self-fulfilling act of comedy. Yes, something, something that was brilliantly demonstrated by the great Stan Laurel in the classic Lauren Hardy film, The Emperor. So as you can see, I've done my research and the rationale for this idea is well founded. The only other thing I want to stress is I am of course fully aware that you'll only be pretending. All right, there's no deceit involved. It's not like you'll be trying to convince me that I'm better at something than I actually am. I know you wouldn't do that. But you never know, this whole thing might lead to me one day being able to find the comedy G-spot for real. <laughs> Now, we're not going to practice this. This isn't a pantomime, so it's not going to mean anything. So I can't hear you all. This side of the room is better than none of that old nonsense, because that would just make the whole thing a complete mockery. Now, we're going to do this in one take. So you guys have just got to be in the moment and go for it. Remember, the more you give, the more you get back. So trust me, really go for it, and it will be just as if something truly amazing is actually happening. Okay. okay. And action. And I've never been more relieved, ladies and gentlemen, to wake up and realise it had all just been a horrendous dream. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening and good night. <laughs>
the decapitating head of one of the David Cameron effigies in what I interpreted as being a satirical attempt at post-ironic revenge. And without thinking about it, I just, I just let out a couple of little giggles, which distracted the pig from its thrusting and left me on the wrong end of an unnervingly prolonged porcine stare. I must have had a panic. <laughs> and I envisaged myself banging on those huge wooden gates in a desperate attempt to get inside, when suddenly a small hatch would open in one of the gates, and I'd be confronted by a face. But a face initially more reminiscent of a neglected scrotum with ginger pubes randomly clumped around a mouth, from which ejaculated the words, What do y'all want, boy? Now, at this point, I should explain that despite Brexit being an exclusively British disease, for some reason, I always seem to default to an admittedly poorly executed southern state straw. Whenever I imagine any sort of post-Brexit scenario, I don't know why it should be necessarily excessive exposure to dystopian boxing. I, I really don't know. But it does seem to me that there is something about the single-celled simplicity of the hick redneck hillbilly mindset that predisposes you not to just surviving in a post-Brexit world but to thriving in it. A mindset seemingly untroubled by tiresome considerations such as personal appearance, decent neighbourly behaviour, or embracing the importance of diversity and maintaining a healthy and forward-thinking society. A mindset championed by President Donald J. Trump. A man who many people see as nominative determinism's greatest international icon, while others just think he talks out of his arse. <laughs> it's just hope he doesn't follow through. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to stick with these southern states. Well, that's a sort of tribute to our shy and retiring American, American cousins. Um, so let's go with that then. So, so she'd say, what do y'all want, boy? <laughs> And I'd say, please, please let me in. I want to join your community. Well, that's woken a few people up, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter about all the long words now, does it really? Now it's started to lie up a bit. And she'd say, you better move your ass, boy. We ain't got no room for strangers here. And the hatch would start to shut. And I'd quickly have to say, no, no, wait, wait. I can be useful to you. And the hatch would start to open again. And she'd say, What can y'all offer us, boy? And I'd say, Well, 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 before, before society broke down, I used to do a bit of stand-up. <laughs> say what? You know, a stand-up comedian. And she'd say, Hmm. Tell us a joke, boy. I said, well, it, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really work like that for me, you see. Uh, I like to think about things and process them into an amusing sort of ramble, a more thoughtful and considered type of comedy, so, so I, could, I could develop a routine that put a sort of humorous slant on the desperate struggle to survive in the hopeless remains of a devastating world. Cheer everyone up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> She'd say... Can you skin a rabbit, boy? Well, I can skin a metaphorical rabbit, you know, where the rabbit represents some prolifically rampant aspect of post-Brexit life, and then proceed to skin it with razor-sharp wit and sarcasm. Or, or, or better still, better still, I could deliberately misconstrue the presumed intention of your question, and for comic effect, give a wordy response about my ability to strip down a popular maker vibrator into its constituent parts, <laughs> effect any maintenance and repairs required as a result of it having been repeatedly thrust into a moist orifice, and then reassemble said vibrator quickly and efficiently in the manner of a semi-automatic assault rifle. <laughs> At which point, I imagine the hat being slammed shut and the gate slowly swinging and open and me being welcomed inside by a dozen or so hillbilly types chuckling mildly at my impromptu performance little knowing that I'd actually prepared the material many months before in anticipation 
of an ideal Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's my enduring hope. That one day, in a post-Brexit world, society will begin to rebuild itself. And in trying not to make the same mistakes again, will come to revere a human-like mind. A more non-binary, sustainable, eco-friendly type of humour. Not like that cheap, nasty, plastic, single-use cock and vag shite that blights today's <laughs> comedy landscape like a Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> and I imagine myself slowly walking into the compound as a heavily tattooed arm is laid welcomingly around my shoulders like a Hawaiian lay. And a voice says... Good to have you here, boy. The timing of your arrival is most fortuitous. Our last stand up, a certain, uh, a certain, uh. Hey, Enos! What was the name of our last stand up? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our last stand up, a certain Pam Ayers. <laughs> she didn't make it. Try to fob us off with some vaginal couplets and gratuitous rhymes about a penis. Ain't that right, Enos? <laughs> we all thought that was heinous. <laughs> Did make us laugh in the end, though, when Enos here got all riled up and decided to express his opinion of Pam's material using our communal vibrator in a gratuitously brutal act of bywatering criticism. A sort of cross between Graham Norton's big chair and the Spanish Inquisition, which nobody was expecting, if you know what I mean, boy. <laughs> to be fair to Pan, though, all her cries and screams were perfectly metered in an endearingly charming West Country lift. <laughs> Made good eating, too. <laughs> but then, <laughs> all you stand-ups do. Thing is, that vibrator ain't worked properly since. And I just don't know what we're gonna do with you if you can't get our rabbit running again. Now, you can fix it, can't you, boy? Can't you, boy? Can't you, boy? Boy! Oi! Oi, oi, mate! The lights are green! Shift your ass before I shove something up it! And I've never been more relieved, ladies and gentlemen, to wake up and realise it had all just been and horrendous dream. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for listening. Jacuzzi time. Mark, Mark Newman, everyone. <laughs>